People are still walking in. Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to the ballroom this afternoon. And uh, yesterday, at the keynote session, uh, In He Su from IBM, she presented her view on cognitive computing and the future in the era of uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0. And basically, she looked at the world as a planet-powered by billions of uh, industrial Internet of Things. And because of that new, new technology, uh, it will literally change the way we do business, something that she called the art of the possible, in that uh, everything that we do, we could change our business model. But in order to make it happen, there is the, the other side of the coin is how to build a new cyber infrastructure that is beyond the cloud computing that we are talking nowadays. We need something that is much faster hardware, more powerful software, more robust uh, network infrastructure, and therefore we need something that is exponentially much more than what we have today. So this is basically what we are trying to achieve in the second keynote. So John C.D. Brown and I, we were discussing about who would be the best guy to do this kind of thing. And the more we thought about it, the more we, we thought that nobody else but Larry Smart would be the best guy to share his vision about the new cyber infrastructure to, to us. So who is this guy? <laughs> Again, for those who haven't met him, this guy actually, the more I talked to him, the more I got so impressed. Um, I, I guess the easiest thing to do is to Google him. Or a little bit easier way to do is to, like, to look into the bio that we put in the conference brochure. Even we add only a few lines of his life, it's so impressive to see how much achievement, awards, and everything that he has put together and his contribution to society. But beyond those official and professional recognition, I have learned quite a few interesting things about Larry that I would like to share with you a little bit. Probably the hottest and most breaking news about his reputation is that you, might, you must have learned in the news that Kip Thorn and two other people got earned the Nobel Prize in Physics this year. And their work is on estimating the radiation when two black holes collide using Einstein equation of relativity. And then when Kip Thorne presented his presentation when he received the prize, he had a picture showing a young Larry Mar Smar with a ponytail hair and naming and recognizing him as a team contributing to the success of uh, his work leading to a Nobel Prize winner. So that is actually quite a recognition. Another Another thing that, impressive, that impresses me about Larry is his choice of hobby. He was, in his earlier life, he was a professor of physics and astronomy. So let me ask you a question. For a guy, a professor of astronomy, who likes, among other things, going to Hawaii, what kind of hobby would he like? Would he like a professor of astronomy going frequently to Hawaii. Well watching, sailing, sky gazing. This is what I guessed, but you and I were wrong. The guy actually likes snorkeling, and he has done that for, <laughs> he has done that for 30 years. And then, um, but the most appropriate thing for me to talk about Larry this afternoon since he's giving a talk on, creative, on creating a global research platform for big data analysis, is that Larry himself, as a human, has made himself a data 
generator. He has a sensor over here to collect his temperature. He has a wrist appliance here to collect his vital sign. He takes sample on his DNA every day to do data analysis. And the second question for this afternoon, guess how many, how much data does he collect on a daily basis on his own body in order to do data analysis? 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. Could you give me an idea? 100,000, 100 million. One more, one more guess. Six billion data points regarding his data, with his DNA-related information. So this is really the concept of big data in, in the context of uh, what he's doing. So with no further ado, let me, please join me to welcome Larry Small, the, key, the second keynote of the day. And I have a pleasure to invite Angela, the youngest uh, and newest uh, doctoral consortium fellow of Hicks Conference to hand over the late to Larry. Well, thanks very much uh, to you, Tong, and to John C. Brown, who has been a very uh, trusted and um, inspirational advisor to me for decades, um, one of my advisors at Cal IT2. Uh, and uh, he actually, I was giving the keynote for Hixus seven years ago on the collaboration technologies that we've developed over the years. It's amazing to me thinking back on that and looking at the talk I gave then that most of what I'm going to talk about today didn't exist and I had no idea was going to exist uh, and yet it's changed everything. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is what I've actually been personally involved in for over 30 years, which is trying to imagine a way to build a distributed system that is, acts as if it's in a single place. And the reason we need to do that is because in the world of data, the data is being generated everywhere. And the idea you're going to take it and all put it in one big bucket in somewhere near a big computer, that's 20th century thinking. Now, 30 years ago, there was a historic moment when NSF took the torch from ARPA and took the ARPANET technologies that Vince Cerf and Robert Kahn and others had developed and created the NSF net connecting the five new supercomputer centers that it created in 1985. I was the PI and director of NCSA in Illinois <clears throat> with NCAR, the um, NSF Center for Atmospheric Research. Now, it's hard to imagine, but the big shared internet pipe across the country at that time <clears throat> was 56 kilobits a second. Um, what we later knew as a dial-up modem. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is um, a world that's about two million times that bandwidth. But the, the important thing is when you have the wide area network so low compared to the so many orders of magnitude less than the backplane of the computer that you're on. Effectively, you have compute and data islands that are separated, like the Hawaiian Islands, from each other. And you're essentially using outrigger canoes to get between the islands. Um, in 10 years later, when we, uh, there was a company called MCI, you may remember, who provided the uh, network to create what was called the very large uh, the VBNS for high bandwidth. Uh, and this had gotten up from 56 kilobits to 1.5 megabits to 45 megabits to 155 megabits, uh, 622, and so on, up to, uh, it was just about 
in the late 90s to go into the first gigabit. But again, the NSF was looking at how could we connect all of the people who in those days they still thought needed to get to supercomputers. Uh, and so they built, they created a program where they shrank the number of supercomputer centers to two, San Diego Supercomputer Center and, and the one I ran at NCSA, and then had vast numbers of partners that were connected, including distributed data and computing. But again, this was connecting to the campus gateway. <laughs> and if you're in the third story of a building on the campus, good luck in terms of your bandwidth to the actual computer or the data. So the vision that we had even back then was with the emergence of fiber optics, which have a capacity to move data at terabits per second, there was no real reason why you couldn't have the wide area network faster than the backplane of the clusters you were connecting. In other words, you would have then a tightly coupled. Now, I'm a physicist originally, so I think of materials properties. So, so spring steel is tightly coupled material, whereas something like rubber is very weakly coupled. And um, the speed of sound actually in those materials, it works the same way. It's much higher in the tightly coupled systems. But the idea was uh, we could actually create a national, even global scale computer that acted as if everything was in the same rack. Um, so in other words, if you think about the bisection bandwidth of a cluster being gigabits per second, for instance, now imagine that over the whole country or the whole world. And that was technically possible. And indeed, NSF, um, uh, 15 years ago, uh, we put in a proposal of this PIF called the Optiputer that said, look, can we at least do a breadboard of this? Can we actually show that it's possible? And that was the so-called Optiputer project with the IP being internet protocol, coupling optical fibers with computers. And we actually did this. Uh, it was a collaboration, uh, not only with multiple universities, but with multiple uh, companies, including IBM, for instance, uh, and with uh, a number of countries like Japan, Korea, the Netherlands, and so forth. And the idea was that you could bring together um, not only the video streams that were just emerging at that time, uh, HD and of course now 4K, uh, but also all of the distributed computers, clusters, uh, scientific instruments, uh, and put them all through an optical switch and then into a scaled up portal that would both scale up the visualization to analyzing the data visually but also scale up the storage, scale up the computing, and so forth. Um, and, and so this was uh, a slide actually from 10 years ago, basically. And it was working. So you might say, well, if that was going on 10 years ago, how come we don't have it today? Why, how come you're telling us you're building it in the future, <laughs> not the past? Well, oddly enough, the director of NSF at that time, uh, Arden Bement, understood what the problem was. We had wide area networks, but they were to the campus gateway. And as Arden, which was quite actually uh, future looking uh, for an NSF director to say something like this, uh, he said, you know, basically we've got like the interstate highway system, six lane highways across the country, but when they get to the campuses, they become two lane roads, or even sometimes said dirt roads. And so the problem is on the campuses into the final end-to-end -to, -end to the end user who's in some building somewhere with some computer. Um, well, notice that was May of 2005. So what happens when, this, when the NSF has something like that, they set out a Blue Ribbon Task Force of folks, and I was on one of these panels that produced this uh, study called Campus Bridging. And that came in in 2011, uh, and it was brought to the NSF as the community input. 
And amazingly enough, NSF put in place a program, and I don't know how many of you know about this program, the Campus Cyber Infrastructure. How many of you have gotten a grant on your campus or been involved in the U.S., of course? One, two, three? <laughs> this is the largest investment by the National Science Foundation and networking on campuses in the history of this country. It's never been anything remotely like this. And it is a complete step function in terms of the capacity that we now have. But most people don't even know it happened. And it's almost over. Um, here's what one looks like on our campus at UC San Diego. Uh, you have a switch, in this case an Arista switch, uh, that is uh, capable of switching uh, very many of these 10 gigabit per second streams. And when I say 10 gigabit, that's 10,000 megabits a second. So how many of you uh, experience as a user 10 megabits a second over the internet? Okay, how many 20? How many 50? How many 100? Okay, so where we're going to is 100,000 megabits per second. That's 100 gigabits per second. Um, and across our campus, we have that working. So we have 120 gigabits per second that connect the San Diego Supercomputer Center with my institute, the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology. Uh, we have 10, 40, 80 gigabit per second clear channels to end users and their instruments, their genome sequencers, their microscopes, their computers, um, now, to put that in perspective, there are 30 or 40,000 users of the shared internet on our campus, and they all their traffic, including all the students watching Netflix, go through one 10 gigabit per second fiber optic. And now I'm going to give it to you, and just you. So that's the kind of jump we're talking about here. Now, if I come to you and I say, it's your lucky day. I'm here. Here's your fiber optic. You're now going to get a thousand times as much data per second into your lab as you have been used to. Good luck. And the first thing you look at this thing and you say, well, where do I plug that into? I've got all this blue wire around here, which is copper, cat six, ethernet. I know I got all kinds of plugs into my computers for that, but where do I put this fiber optic? So that was the next thing we had to fix. So we would now gotten the wide area, we would gotten the local area, and now we have to terminate it. And so you know how any networking system works, the engineering that goes into say the cell phone, nothing in the cell phone is engineered beyond what the Wi-Fi and shared and the commercial internet, uh, wireless internet can bring in, in terms of data because otherwise, why would you do that? So the same with your PC. It's, this PC is configured and engineered to handle essentially the shared internet. And the shared internet is basically about putting photographs from you know, cats on, apparently. This seems to be, a, you know, aliens came down and look at planet Earth. There's cat videos. That's, that's what the internet was built for. So you got anything bigger than a cat video, you're out of luck because that's what the world invested in, was an infrastructure to handle cat videos. So if you've got gigabytes to terabytes, don't think about using the internet to send it across. Okay, it's gonna take forever. That's what we had to deal with. So we're now giving you a thousand times the bandwidth, but we've gotta be able to terminate that flow, that fire hose, right? But amazingly, what I've, my colleagues and I have done for 30 years is just ride the commercial product space, and in particular, personal computer-driven space. And so these are actually just personal computers, whether they're desk side or, or in racks. But they may have, say, a 100 terabyte rotating disk. They may have six or seven terabytes of, of flash. Uh, they have 10, 40, 80, or 100 gigabit per second network interface cards, so they can terminate optical flows at that speed. And then they have very large RAM. Uh, but they're PCs, and so they're very inexpensive. And in fact, if you, all you want is a thousand megabits per second, we can give you that for a few hundred dollars now uh, as a termination device. I mean, it's really amazing. I don't think 
we sometimes appreciate the magic of the world we live in. Um, you know, <laughs> each of these PCs has way more, has like 100 times the memory of a Cray 2, <laughs> 100 gigabytes, something like that. That cost me $15,000 when I bought a Cray 2 in, in 1988, you know? I had to build a whole building to put it in. Um, so, so by using the commercial technology, we're able to make these so inexpensive that you basically use your supply budget. Now, how does that transform the doing of science? Well, here's an example on our um, uh, campus where uh, Rob Knight, who is one of the leaders in the world in the microbiome, which is very big data. I'm giving a keynote talk tomorrow at a conference up the beach uh, at the Pacific Symposium on Biocomputing on the Microbiome. Vast amounts of data. Um, to put it in perspective, 90% uh, of the cells that have DNA in your body are not human. And they have DNA in them. Uh, and the human cells have DNA, the cells that have DNA, just 10 to 1. But if you ask how many genes are there on the DNA in your body, there are something less than 25,000 genes on your human DNA. There's about 2 million genes on the microbes. So you're talking about a tenth of 1%, basically. And so that, it changes, I mean, think about medicine. is dealing with 10% of the parts and a tenth of a percent of the genome by looking at the human? How, is that, how, how well do you think that's gonna work out? But in the next five years, because of the big data revolution, all of this microbiome data is gonna to come to the world. So what we've got is one of these Fiona's, the flexible uh, IO network appliances that we call them, these PCs in Rob's lab, connected across these 10 gigabits to the genome sequencing center and from there over to my institute where they can use the big wall to look at uh, 50 times the resolution of your, of your laptop uh, for data, visual data analysis, and then over to the San Diego Supercomputer Center, uh, which has now by now over 10 petabytes of storage, but then it has <clears throat> these big supercomputers that are optimized for big data analysis. Um, and <clears throat> so Rob's Center for Microbiome Innovation can also then reach out to the NIH, for instance, the National Database on Microbiomes. Uh, and so this is the infrastructure which he's now doing his research on compared to just being one of 30,000 people running across the internet and trying to get his data from point A to point B. Uh, to put that in perspective, Rob and I are burning a CPU century uh, per year on the supercomputer just to analyze the microbiome data. So that's over a million CPU hours. Um, so we're in your computer 24 seven for 100 years. We use that much computer time every year. So we got a lot of data that we have to look at. I must say I'm very pleased to be uh, with Rob and, and my colleagues at UCSD, part of a new IBM Cognitive Horizons um, uh, network. We're one of the I guess we're the newest member of this, as a university, studying, um, helping tutor Watson in uh, healthy aging, but also in the microbiome. So by the time we're done, we will have brought in all of this microbiome information into Watson uh, so that its ability to help uh, in healthcare will be um, greatly increased, we hope. So the next logical step is given that we have over 100 campuses that have this, now this campus infrastructure, um, none of which had it uh, when I gave my last colloquial, my last keynote here. <laughs> it's hard to believe how fast things have changed. Uh, but the obvious next thing is, well, can we hook them all together? And so I wrote a proposal with my colleagues uh, called the Pacific Research Platform, which has now been funded at a million a year for five years. And it hooks together essentially all the research universities on the West Coast. So that's all of the 10 UC campuses, the um, um, one of the Cal State campuses, Stanford, Caltech, USC, the three privates, uh, as well as national labs, NASA Ames, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and then up to the University of Washington. 
but then we also extend out to Chicago and to Hawaii, and then beyond that to a few international partners I'll end with. And the idea is to make this all hook together as one big optically connected computer in which basically you have this enorm enormous um, speed. Well, to do something like this, remember a million dollars is about three FTEs. So, so, but we have this amazing, this is one of the largest volunteer projects in US history that the NSF has run. So we have over 50 different campuses, uh, CIOs and IT leadership, as well as uh, uh, 50, 32 of those, 50 researchers. All of these are scientific researchers that are on leading edge uh, computing, uh, big data science applications. And none of them are getting paid from this grant. They're all doing it because they think this is the future. Okay, so now what we do is we, um, create these, these terminating devices, these Fionas, and we drop ship them all over the place. So we've got like 30 of these or 40 of these that have now been put out there. And then four times a day, we do end-to-end -end measurements, disk to disk, of uh, 10, gigabit, 10 gigabyte file transfers. And then we measure with a variety of software tools hardware tools, the throughput, disk to disk. Now, this is an unnatural act. Nobody who runs the networks is in charge of the end-to-end -end network. So on your, in your building, the department controls how you do the networking. On your campus is the campus CIOs. Then you got your regional optical networks. Then you got your national internet twos, your international networks. There is no one, no entity in charge of the end end. There's, who are you gonna call? Ghostbusters, right? Who are you gonna call? And so that's why we decided, okay, we'll make it our business. So we put together a distributed team of probably 30 or more of the best network engineers on the West Coast who every week for an hour have a phone call to debug this. And you'll notice that when we started, we had uh, everything was or orange, or, which means you can't uh, even see the, get the data across. Uh, now we have many, many more and they're all green, uh, which means they're doing more than five gigabits per second disk to disk. Now, one of the big uh, software revolutions, once you've sort of got this hardware end-to-end -end set up, so you've got the terminating devices, you've got the networks, now you've got to put software over all of this, right, to make it act like a single computer. One of the great innovations that uh, Fernando Perez at Berkeley has developed, uh, first was Python and then is, is uh, Jupyter. So these give you electronic notebooks, which are just the web, for software and data. So in other words, you have live software, your data is live, the visualizations are live, and if you just give somebody a URL, then that notebook is now on your, your machine and you can execute, you just click on it and the software executes, the data you can pull out and put it into your code and so forth. It's a real revolution and it is the basic paper, you know, that we are doing digital sciences on. So it's, 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 it's been a huge revolution. And so the first thing we did is they said, okay, well we have to have that software across the Pacific Research Platform. So we now, we made a big hunky Fiona, that's a technical term, uh, really powerful one, and we drop shipped it at Berkeley to the headquarters of C Jupiter and then to San Diego and then connected them at 40 gigabits a second. That provides a backplane for now extending it uh, everywhere across not only the UC system but all of the uh, different places. Now how many of you know what are using Kubernetes? Okay, IBM up front, good. Uh, IBM's a good supporter of that as well. This is, I had no idea what that term meant, it's Greek for pilot or captain, um, uh, until we started using it. One of our wizards brought it to my attention, John Graham. Uh, this is, this is one of the most important software innovations that I've seen in my lifetime. 
the, Google developed the first real planetary computer. So data centers all over the world. Now, you know, it's also Microsoft and um, Facebook and, 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 and uh, AWS and so forth, are, and many of the banks and everything. But, but fundamentally, you've got this problem I'm dealing with in the cloud. It's the basis of the cloud. You have all of these distributed computers that have to act like they're one. When you go searching, you're not searching this, you're not logging into this data center over in Netherlands or this one over here, you just want an answer, right? So they found a way in software to handle this. And the way they do it is they take all the applications, put them in what are called containers, and then those containers can just be moved around and they, can, they have all the information they need to execute them on any in computer. Uh, and so then they developed this thing called Kubernetes, which is a container orchestration software system that essentially allows them to put any executable on any machine uh, and with no human intervention. And this thing, it's, it's I mean, it's hard to believe it. It was, uh, it came out in uh, basically two years ago. Um, it, this is two of the people at Google, to the wizards, it's just a way of stitching together all these machines into basically a big computer. Where have you heard that before in the last 15 minutes? Okay, so the cloud has already done what we're talking about doing in the academic world. Uh, and then everything at Google runs in a container. This is the world of 2017. And so I really encourage you to get to know about this. Uh, I had to. And this is just from Christmas Day. Um, uh, all of the industries are joined in on this now. Uh, there are probably 40 at least different companies, uh, including IBM, that are, are supporting this, including all of the cloud providers as well. Now, this is a little bit technical, but now that we've got that software to do the containers, you've got to do storage, okay? And Again, the miracle of open source, Rook is this open source thing that takes uh, object storage and the emergent one that everybody seems to be using is Ceph. And essentially all of the storage on all of the computers is now all orchestrated by Rook under Kubernetes. And, and I know this sounds a little technical, but you gotta know this stuff. Uh, this is the distributed fabric of the world today. And it is why the world works. And if you're going to build things like applications on top of it, this is the sort of thing. So finally, here's what, two years ago, we finally got to the nirvana that we've been going after for 30 years. On all these distributed computers, which you can see here are everywhere from UCSD to Caltech, um, Stanford, um, uh, Berkeley and so forth, we have these Fionas that are called digital transfer nodes and then, and then they have the storage, Ceph storage on them and then they've got uh, all of the Kubernetes is organizing the movement of executables in these containers all over this thing. So this is one computer to first order, even though it's totally distributed. And it's so tightly coupled that you might say, well Larry, if you have all these big data, you're not going to be moving these big datas all over the place. That would, you know, I mean, like, that's crazy. Well, the whole point is, if, think about it, if you've got a cluster over here, its backplane is running at, a, say, 10 gigabits a second. If it's connected wide area at 100 gigabits a second, the data here and the computers here are already co-located. It's just a question of speed of light latency that's left. But you were already doing that. If you, in architectural terms, any cluster is, is a non-uniform memory access cluster. That means from this computer to this computer to this computer on the cluster, if you have to get a piece of, piece of data that's on this memory, this memory, this memory, it takes a different amount of time to get it to the CPU, non-uniform memory access. Well, now, if you have one that's at Stanford instead of at UCSD, it's just a little bit more of a way to go to get the data, but you already are in that game. 
So from a software or an algorithm point of view, it doesn't really matter. You're all one in this one big computer. Okay, that's enough about computer architecture. What about the applications? So I'm an I started as an application scientist, and I had to learn all this computer stuff. But fundamentally, think about any given big science team, astronomy team, uh, uh, particle physics, large hadron collider, uh, biomedical data, we've been talking about, uh, even visualization, earthquake engineering. Imagine you're a professor and you're in some campus, right? And you've got some data. You don't have all the data. You've got collaborators at other universities and they've got data and they've got data and then there's data in the National Repository, then there's a big supercomputer over here, then there's your cluster, then there's, you know, your personal computer. I mean, it's all distributed. So I went out, malice aforethought, to find my users who were already collaborating with other people at different institutions over the normal internet. And I said, okay, would you like to be part of this experiment? And we'll give you a thousand X increase in your bandwidth connecting your collaborators and all your data and everything. And then the question is, how does your science change? Well, here's an example of a Large Hadron Collider, which generates an unbelievable amount of data every second, distributes it to thousands of researchers all over the world. This is a trace of the speed going from the cluster on the third floor of the physics building at UCSD all the way to Fermilab and Chicago. And you'll notice the scale over here is 30 gigabits a second sustained. Whereas before, over the shared internet, you might get 30 million bits a second, right? So this is using the Pacific Research Platform for particle physics. I had no idea what the aggregate demand for, say, cancer data is. So one of the big revolutions in science uh, in, in terms of um, fighting cancer is not to think of it as you've got ovarian cancer or breast cancer or brain cancer or whatever. It's a software disease. So this cancer cell in your body somewhere was previously one of your human cells. And so it had a DNA that was like the DNA in all your other cells. Then it got mutated. Where? What was the mutation? Was it inversion? Was it a duplication? Was it a, okay. So the revolution in the last five years has been to go through and find out in that six billion bases of diploid DNA, what exactly kind of software failure did you have? What, where in your code did you have somebody pull out a go-to statement and put in, you know, an if then? And so the, all that data now from each patient is being put together by the NIH into a national database, which was at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Well, then you can imagine everybody who is in an oncology um, practice is, wants to download that data to compare it with their local patient that they've got. And so here over 2012, 2013, and 2016 is the aggregate download and you can see by the time of already January of 2016 is two years ago, it was peaking at 15 gigabits per second sustain. That's why you need these kind of networks. So then the NIH finished uh, that uh, project and it moved to Chicago, but it turned out we, of course, have been working with Chicago as part of the PRP, so we just sent them Fiona to the new place at the University of Chicago, and we continue. So this allows for the kind of flexibility that you see when federal agencies change where they're going. Well, I mentioned distributed virtual reality. We've been doing that for 30 years. That's what I did a lot of my keynote on um, back uh, seven years ago. And so we are building virtual reality facilities around, here's one, for instance, up at UC Merced, UC San Diego. We put them tied together by the optical fiber, and we can now move two gigabytes a second in two seconds. So essentially, you can have people in these distributed spaces that are in the same virtual space, but at a resolution maybe 100 times an Oculus Rift 
which is the head-mounted display that Facebook and now is selling. So this is like, you know, what you'll have in your commercial consumer VR in 10 years or something. Um, somebody may have noticed last winter that it rained a lot in California. These are called atmospheric rivers. And the study of where the atmosphere condenses out water and then dumps it on the ground is a very essential thing to understand at a time of sustained global change. Uh, because we are a water planet, and that's where almost all the heat is stored from um, the CO2 that causes global warming. Uh, and it changes the evaporation rate, and most of the changes in the weather will actually be in precipitation events. So we have a center at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and they're in a big data collaboration with a Center for Hydrometeorology at Irvine. And they were using the regular internet back and forth. We put Fiona's at both ends, put them on the Pacific Research Platform, and a workflow of moving big data from, say, something, the, the Irvine one is following all the precipitation events worldwide, uh, and then the, the uh, one at San Diego is then looking at the West Coast, out to Arizona, and how that, uh, things like atmospheric rivers uh, or droughts uh, happen based on where the rest of the world is. They were taking 20 days for an entire movement of data before they could do one unit of science. That's now down to 20 hours, which means instead of once uh, a month making a unit of science, they can now do once a day. And when we get it up to 100 gig point to point, it's going to be down to 20 minutes. That means you can make that same amount of science happen once an hour. So it's really transformational in that sense. Now the thing we learn is as soon as you have all this hardware, then you got the software, then you got the applications, and it's all big data, the next thing they come and tell you is, now I gotta have machine learning. And this gets to what we heard in the keynote yesterday. So one of the things they do is each of these precipitation objects is born somewhere develops, like think of a thunderstorm developing, it's moving across the plains, and then it has a tornado, and then it finally goes away, or a hurricane, or anything else. That's a space-time object. So they actually keep all this stuff in object stores like Ceph, and um, then can do machine learning to figure out, well, where do the precipitation events in the world actually mostly start? <laughs> uh, but it's a machine learning on these big object stores. Um, and then the second thing uh, on our campus is I'd been putting this fiber optic everywhere. Well, it went to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, which has this famous pier in La Jolla going out. Well, we said, well, why stop at the pier? Why not put the fiber in the water? And what that allowed them to do was to put microscopes on the fiber to look at the phytoplankton in the ocean. And they now have over 300 million images that they've generated in the last year or two. And so they came to me and said, Larry, we need machine learning now to figure out who's who. I mean, we're not gonna, say, I mean, you do remember in the 50s, right, that they used graduate students to look at bubble chamber photographs that they now make like, I don't know, 100 million per second uh, at CERN. <laughs> so I presume they used to use graduate students for this, but in this new world of big data, that's not going to work so well. So we put a new NSF grant to say, okay, we went back to NSF and said, oh, we just forgot one thing. We got to put machine learning on top of this Pacific Research Platform. And so we got um, a new grant that just started uh, in October. And we went out, remember, I had all these 20 or 30 campuses, I got all these different application people, but the one thing I hadn't talked to was a computer scientist. But I knew all these people now. So I went back to the campuses and I say, are any of you guys interested in machine learning? Have you heard about that? 
and so I ended up with 30 faculty from um, 10 different universities, Berkeley, Caltech, Stanford, U UC San Diego, and so forth, um, that said, yes, and we're doing this kind of algorithm on this kind of architecture, and so, again, they volunteered to be part of this project. But it's very interesting, you know, in machine learning, uh, CAFE is the most widely used university developed open source uh, library for machine learning, and Professor uh, Trevor Darrell at Berkeley was the head of the team that developed that. And we went to him and he said, well, what, what, you know, what do you guys need to actually amplify, to accelerate your, your work? And they said, well, GPUs is what everybody's using, but there's two kinds of GPUs. There's, there's the gaming GPUs that they sell, you know, 50 million a year. Um, and then there's the, those are 32-bit. And then there's the 64-bit ones, which are like in all the supercomputers and Amazon Web Services and so forth. They're quite expensive compared to the gaming ones. And I'm not telling you this, Professor Trevor Darrell is telling you this in uh, a quote he allowed us to put in the proposal, that basically that's what you need for machine learning, maybe even 16-bit, in some cases even 8-bits, because the data that you're machine learning on has such uncertainties in it that if you're doing double precision arithmetic on it, you're fooling yourself that you're getting something that's more accurate. Now there may be situations where you actually need that extra accuracy and by all means use 64-bit, but he was saying that what we in the computer science community and universities are missing is gaming GPUs. And so I went back and I scratched my head and I said, but don't our Fiona's, our PCs, have slots in them. <laughs> Turns out we could put, I mean, don't you put gaming cards in slots in PCs to do gaming? <laughs> so we can put eight of these. These are the top of the line NVIDIA, um, or at least they were uh, last, uh, in 2017. Uh, but we can put eight of these in. And now you have a kick-ass um, machine learning uh, big data analytics platform. Uh, so uh, one year ago, I went to UCSD and I said, well, if this is what the top people in computer science Berkeley are saying, what do we have in the way of that at UCSD? And they said, gaming, GPUs, uh, that would be the goose egg, zero. A year later, we have 350 of them. We have them uh, that are set up in uh, the Open Science Grid for applications with the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Our newest cave has 70 of these things just to drive the graphics. And most of the time, we're not looking at anything. So, and they're connected at 40 gigabits a second. So that's an awesome machine learning thing. The grant itself is gonna put another 90, almost 100 of them. Uh, and then we went to our CEIO and said, um, let's see, we have a master's program in data science now. We're starting an undergraduate program in data science. What, where are, the, where are the, the GPUs that you're allowing the students to learn machine learning on? What, where, are they, what, where are they? Oh, you don't have any. They got with the program. Now we have uh, nearly 100 and that'll go much greater this year. So the GPUs, the, what are graphics processing units, were built to accelerate graphics, have, of course, become what you're using to accelerate machine learning. But they're von Neumann architectures, the same architecture that we've been using for 60 years to build computers out of. However, it turns out that I would say the biggest trend in hardware right now is non von Neumann machine learning accelerators. This is just taking off everywhere because machine learning, as we heard yesterday from the keynote, is everywhere. If it's at everywhere, then we better have more computing power to execute all that extra machine learning. Well, are we gonna do that on von Neumann processors alone? Well, here is the deputy director, Horst Simon, who's a colleague of mine for 30 years in supercomputing, 
uh, quote he says, is he believes it will merge to a hybrid model. So you know any uh, petaflop supercomputer now doesn't have just multi-core CPUs, it's also got GPUs. That didn't happen 10 years ago. The need was to accelerate computationally intensive things, and so that's why they put the GPUs in. But now that machine learning is going to come together because in the next generation of supercomputer we're building in this country called the Exascale, the call from the President of the United States, the former President of the United States, I might say, um, said that in the architecture you're going to make data analytics just as important as traditional solving partial differential equations, high performance computing. Well, that's a little different. That's never happened before in the design of a supercomputer. So we're going to have to add the machine learning into the supercomputer itself, and that's why these non von Neumann things um, are going to be important. So two years ago, I went to our top machine learning professor, uh, Ken Kreutz-Dogato, and said, uh, it looks like we're going to have to um, put together a lab to study all of this. Uh, and so we're now not just looking at deep neural nets, we're looking at all these different ways, all these are all just different classes of machine learning algorithms. Uh, and we're going to start looking at the non von Neumann architectures. Now IBM again uh, was a pioneer in this and Demendra Moda who was a, a graduate of UC San Diego School of Engineering, this is the cover of science in 2014 and this is a brain-inspired uh, architecture, a non von Neumann architecture. And you'll notice that in that article, Demendra says, you know, we don't just have single chips, but we have on the drawing boards multiple parallel versions of that. Well, the next year in 2015, Lawrence, Berkeley, Lawrence National, uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab collaborated with IBM and built a 16 processor version, and now the Air Force has um, a 64 processor. So this is, in just two years, or three years, uh, done exactly what uh, IBM uh, said it was, uh, brain-inspired computing chief scientist. So, almost done. The final stage in building this national global scale big data analytics machine is to surround the Pacific Research Platform with the von Neumann GPUs on it from this grant with, for instance, the 64-bit ones, and NSF has a number of supercomputer centers that are, have those, but then the clouds. The Amazon Web Services has all the 64-bit. Google has its non von Neumann, what are called TPUs that accelerate TensorFlow, which is its open source software for machine learning. Um, <clears throat> IB, uh, Microsoft has the uh, FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, that it has put in every server to accelerate Bing search. IBM has both the uh, uh, True North that we talked about, but it's also got its IB, IBM's uh, cloud platform and Watson uh, that we'll be linking in. And then there's a whole bunch of startups like uh, uh, New Edge and uh, Nirvana that Intel recently bought and others that are building non von Neumann uh, machine learning accelerators. So where are we going with all this? Well last August, just a few months ago, uh, NSF had us hold the first uh, workshop and brought 150 people together to say how can we take this from the Pacific Research Platform and make a national version of it. And we're having a series of workshops this coming year to follow that up. But my last slide that I want to show you with uh, is that this is from the birth, been global. So in addition to um, the um, U.S. version, the Netherlands, which has been a longtime partner of ours, has been in this, is in the proposal. Australia, Japan, Korea joined, and we just recently had a Fiona and, and Korea doing five gigabits per second disk to disk across the Pacific. So the, the fact that it's high bandwidth and long distance no longer matters. Uh, we're, we've been able to get around that problem. And uh, Guam, we just put a Fiona ad, and Singapore, we just sent one in. So this is all the same kind of, all within the same rack, global scale. 
Okay, so I would just leave you with this. You know, it took us 30 years. I'm not going to, I'm 69, I'm not going to be around to help you guys figure this all out, but now that we finally have this tightly coupled global scale thing that includes extensions into the cloud, Kubernetes extends into all the clouds, what are we going to do with it? Uh, how are we going to get application people to actually move over to it? That's a very big problem. I didn't have time to get into cybersecurity, but there's a, a lot, this, this is a lot more secure than things that are attached to the normal shared internet, but there are a lot of uh, issues there. Yes, we have multiple 10 gigabit links into AWS, and we will certainly uh, into IBM and, and to Google soon. Uh, that doesn't mean they've got the internals like we have, the Fionas and so forth, that do the internal tight coupling inside the cloud complex. That's unsolved uh, so far. But how, I mean, look, we've got 20 or 30 universities. There's 200 self-identified research universities in the United States alone. I mean, there's 40 or 50 here at this countries, you know, uh, at this, at Hixis. So how do we scale this? It's, it, it is not really an engineering problem anymore. Yes, there are some details, but it's fundamentally a social political uh, problem. And um, that's where I will leave you. Thank you very much. Eight hours, if I can do it. I actually measure uh, every heartbeat, and I measure uh, every moment I'm asleep. So that's eight hours sleeping, and it takes about ten hours in the bed to do that. So the question uh, for those out in the streaming land uh, is, uh, can I talk about exascale? Uh, so. The way that supercomputers uh, go, I remember the first megaflop computer, million floating point operations per second, and then when I bought the Cray 2, that was the first gigaflop, and then um, the first teraflop, and then nowadays uh, they're in the tens of petaflops, and so the United States is committed to making an exaflop uh, computer, which is a thousand times a petaflop. Uh, First of all, it'll be very interesting whether the United States makes it first or whether China does. Um, and the other is, will it really be new technology or will they just squeeze everything in the current version so that they can just get over the gate, you know, over the finish line and say they've done an exascale with 10-year-old technology? Uh, that's the most likely outcome. <laughs> it's not the most interesting one. But the other thing is, you know, oh my God, as a person, as a guy who's done supercomputing for 40 years, you know, trying to talk about a supercomputer like it's a big thing anymore, you know, I mean, each of these is way more powerful than a Cray 2, and there's a billion of them. And you, I mean, I don't know how much the cloud providers add a year, 100,000, a million of these. I mean, that is where the world's computational uh, supply is, not in individual supercomputers. And in fact, one of the big challenges, I think, really big, eth almost cultural challenges for supercomputer centers is to get rid of the center and get into the real world and in integrate. And that's what the beauty of this with Kubernetes, it integrates the supercomputer centers and the clouds and the clusters and the PCs and the instruments. It doesn't really matter because everything's in a container and just running around in this uh, you know, highly connected space. It, it takes a lot of re-engineering your brain to think in this space. And I got to give it to the cloud providers. 
I think they have attracted a whole new generation of people who can think this way and who engineer stuff at a scale that is just beyond anything any of us had ever imagined doing. And they do it at a level of customer satisfaction and reliability that is superhuman. I mean, never, I don't, I mean, it's, it's just amazing to me um, how, how, how incredibly engineered this world is. So what we're trying to do is to make sure the academic world doesn't get totally left behind. I mean, the problem is that the cloud providers are this giant sucking sound that is pulling all of our leadership out of faculty and so forth out of the universities. Well, who's going to teach the next generation of students if everybody's working for a cloud provider? So part of the motivation for this is to get uh, the academics working on a system that is in some ways more powerful, although different in the times of data that it looks at than, than the cloud providers, and one that integrates very smoothly you know, with the cloud providers so that we can all lift our boats simultaneously. Yeah, one question back. So I've, I've lived through, as I said, each of these thousand-fold increases, starting with the mega <laughs> flop. And as you say, the reason it's so difficult, like, remember vectorization? So when the Cray-1 came out, it wasn't the first vector machine, but it was like at the labs. That was, there was a, a year-long strategic vectorization uh, exercise before the Cray showed up. <laughs> and that was to take all the codes and to you know, like interchange the I's and the J's and the do loops so that you could use the vectors to speed things up instead of just running the scalar. And, and so it was a whole year of just software engineering to get ready for this. So it's, it is, as you say, it's the hardware and the software and the application codes, all of them have to go to a whole new level of, of change. And when you get to the exascale, um, you know, it's like a billion gigaflop machines. So think about what the error rate is in one of these, and now multiply that times a billion, and it's going to be like the ENIAC, you know, where you had to go around with people changing vacuum tubes all the time because they were burning out um, if we're not careful with fault tolerance. And that may mean that you have a whole new set of algorithms that are fault tolerant. They just say, well, one of the computers in this million that I was running on, you know, or 10 of them or something, you know, randomly just went dead. Or, or, you know, whatever, gave bad answers. And, but I've got to have an algorithm that's tolerant to that. I mean, after all, biological systems work that way. If you had to have everything perfect to 13 digits for every cell in your body, for every biochemical, you'd all be dead. Well, maybe on that positive note, we'll stop. Thank you. <laughs>